Shane was standing right there. I go, look, Shane, there's a track. And then he looks, he goes, look behind you. And we had individuals camping on the property that heard stuff back in this general direction. And they said where the tracks were, and I came over here to look at them. And you turn around and see, well, what was this thing doing here? Here's what it's doing. It's watching the door. But this is exactly how you discover it here. On the edges of the Olympic Peninsula, nestled in the foothills of the coastal range, Sasquatch researchers have gathered in a red building dubbed the Olympic Project Cabin. For over a decade, this building has served as a sort of headquarters for members of the Olympic Project as well as other researchers from around the country. Within its walls is a variety of research material, from books to footprint casts, and the nearby mountains serve as an ideal environment in which to conduct their work. But the location of the cabin and the property on which it sits was not chosen by accident. The Olympic Project headquarters is a unique property because it's almost alone in the sea of wilderness. On one side is Olympic National Park. On the other side is Olympic National Forest. There are no neighbors. There are no neighbors. I like the closest neighbors at least a half mile away. And it, they're very, very sparse. In the early days, we put cameras all around that place, not on the property there, but on the Mueller Trail. Uh, up the Mueller Trail on Appleton Ridge, on Aurora Ridge, which is right across the highway. So I had known about that place for quite some time because I'd hiked by it. I'd also known about it because it was kind of like grandfathered in. There's no neighbors. And this place just sits in an amazing place. So in about a year and a half span, I believe, I investigated three road crossing sightings there, one of them through the BFRO, and then two of them were people that had just come to me. All three sightings were credible. One of the sightings had the creature crossing over almost directly onto the property right there. And so I always thought in the back of my head, this place is for whatever reason, there's a crossing here. They, they just cross the road here in, in this general area, you know, within a few mile span right there. And so it was really, really funny that Wally was up here again, early days of the Olympic project, and Wally wanted to drive all the way around the Olympics. So I drove him the entire circle, and it takes the better part of a day. It's a long drive. And as we did, I would point out different ridges where we had cameras, and he was just all over it. He thought that was so cool, and it was very ambitious. I mean, we were operating 60 cameras in remote places was very ambitious, because we're talking about 3,000 foot up a ridge, off trail. I mean, it, it was pretty crazy. So he was really liking that. But as we drove by that place, the LP, I had told him, I said that, you know, three road crossing sightings right in here. And he's like, that place is amazing. It sits all by itself. And then he goes, man, if that ever goes for sale, we got to buy it. So I was cool. Catalog that, you know, and off we went. Well, about a week later, I was on my way to CQ, Washington to go fishing. And I drove by, by and there was a real estate sign there. And I was just like, oh my God. Oh my God. So I called the realtor, called Wally. By the end of the day, he had it bought. And he basically he said, Derek, half of this is yours. We'll partner in on this and take care of the place and let's roll forward and do our Bigfoot stuff here. So that's what we did. And that's how it came to be. And then since then, you know, we've, we've ran multiple, multiple expeditions there, private and public and use the area very heavily for research, and it's been fantastic. So this is a unique opportunity to study Sasquatches long term on a property where they apparently come. Um, if they're not going exactly to the property, then they're going around the property. Three sightings within a half mile of the driveway, and now two or three track finds and countless vocalizations over the years because there's researchers not living there, but visiting there quite frequently. It serves as headquarters, it serves as a hangout place, it serves as a flop house for people like me when I need a place to stay and I'm passing through. It is a, um, a fantastic property. The unique location and history of the Olympic Project cabin make it a perfect spot 
to conduct Sasquatch research in a place that gets results fairly often. In August of 2023, while hosting an expedition at the Olympic Project headquarters, a trackway was discovered by Shane Corson and Chris Spencer towards the foothills of the mountains. This trackway was still being researched and cataloged by the time I arrived a few weeks later, and our objective was to go straight to the headquarters and finish the work Chris Spencer had begun. You want to interview me right here? Yeah, we're going to interview Todd right on the side of the highway. As you can see, we have uh, California poppies here, but we're not in California. We are on the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State. I don't know if you know this, but Corona is kind of like the hub of Riverside County, the Inland Empire. But we're nowhere near there. <laughs> <laughs> Before we resume our regularly scheduled program, I would like to take a moment to tell you about the 2024 Small Town Monsters Kickstarter. Already we are very close to achieving our goal, but you can continue to help out because we'll be aiming for a stretch reward. If you like this series and you like what I produce, maybe you can help us reach our stretch reward, which is an entire new film directed by yours truly called Cursed Waters, The Creature of Lake Okanagan, which will feature me and my good friend Jason Hewlett as we travel to British Columbia in search of the infamous Ogo Pogo. So if you haven't yet, please consider backing the project. There's plenty of rewards you can get, including all of our movies for 2024 on Blu-ray and DVD, and much, much more. Click the link in the description of this video and that'll take you straight to the Kickstarter page where you can back and become part of the Small Town Monsters family. Now, back to the program. After stretching our legs for a bit, Chris Spencer was quick to start reviewing audio. All right, what do you want, what do you want me to do? You want me to... I, was gonna, I was inspired in the car but to, ask, in, to ask a question. All right. If you guys were given a million dollars to do research, what would you do? A million dollars? A million dollars to study this thing. Yeah. Or to attempt to study this thing. But if I, if I was given a million dollars, you know, and it had to all go towards the subject matter research, I'd, I'd live in the woods. I'd live in the woods. I'd buy the gear I need. Chris can speak to this as well. I'd get a bunch of thermal units. I would actually pay somebody like a wildlife biologist to come out with, with us, a professional. Yeah, get some professional. Uh, outside of the Bigfoot world, not yeah. not, and, and no offense to anybody in the Bigfoot world that's even a wildlife biologist. But I want somebody that has, it's not been tainted, that has no bias, and uh, maybe more than one, maybe two. And uh, well, with inflation, a million bucks really ain't that much anymore. It, that's true. So all right, all right, raise the ante, ten million dollars. Yeah, I'd oh, live yeah. In, we'd live in the woods. Period. We'd find a location, which we have multiple locations. Uh, and we'd spend all of our time, literally, being out there. Not to habituate Sasquatch, but to, you know. I know if we had enough remote therms that could re record constantly, placed out there, eventually you'd get one. Well, what kind of equipment would you get? <clears throat> like Chris said. Thermal gear. Thermal gear. i get LiDAR, DNA collection kits. Um, I wouldn't even mind getting into the realm of uh, ground sensors. When you yeah. sense seismic sensors. seismic sensors yeah i i love those things i it's 
That's because I know our government has stuff like that. Some of it you can't even buy, I don't think, legally. But they, you can right. you can place ground sensors out there, and you can get not only the position of whatever's walking, you can get its weight. Its weight is huge. And you get something out no there point. walking around that's 600 pounds, you know it's not a black bear. You know it's not a black-tailed deer. Or SM4s. So you can have GPS put in them. And if you have at least three, they will automatically triangulate where the sound's coming from. I don't know how accurate it is, but I do know you can do that. So. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, I mean, the sky's the limit when you're talking that kind of money. We all have jobs. We have lives and families, you know, just like a lot of the other researchers out there, you know, unless you're retired. But right now in my prime, I call myself as far as my physical capabilities. When I retire, I'm probably going to be limited. Well, that's like, I, they, I think about that all the time. I'm 51. I still am capable of doing a lot. But as a construction worker, I know when I hit my 60s, I'm not going to be able to hike what I'm hiking right now. Exactly. I'm, I'm not going to be able to physically do what I do right now. And that's why I get so, that's, you know, you asked about frustration. That's where I get frustrated. I get frustrated that I don't have the time to go do everything I want to do. Because I'm looking at, yeah, I'm getting ready to retire, but I'm not going to be able to do it. That's frustrating to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you got to capitalize on the time and you got to capitalize on the money that you have because we're not, uh, we're self-sustained. You know, we have to go with what we got within our means and we are limited. You know, we're not uh, funded by, we're definitely not funded Dude. by an institution like, you know, like some of these scientists, you know, when they do a project, you know, we're going to go study cross river gorillas. They have a budget, they have funds and they have time. That's their job. This is about as much as a job as one can do without getting paid. But it's a job we love to do, but still, it's not a full-time job. It can't be, unfortunately. And that's, I think, one of the biggest issues with this research. You know, uh, money can get you so far, but it's all about the time. And as Chris said, none of us are getting any younger. You know, um, but we're fortunate, though. We have a couple key areas that we pump the money in, we pump the time in, and it's paying off. It's slowly paying off. And we're seeing results, we're seeing patterns, we're seeing trends. Um, and scientists actually, you know, academics are starting to pay attention. So I'm pretty excited about that. And then we got Todd Hell here. He's an absolute beast of a man. This guy is legendary. Under the radar, but legendary. <laughs> At the present moment, the Olympic project is not funded by any external source. However, part of the group's unique history involves wealthy benefactor Wally Hersom backing the group. I had the pleasure of knowing Wally, and I've spent a lot of time in the field with Wally Hersom. He became a very, very good friend for a long time. He's just a sweet, sweet guy, and we have so much in common too, by the way, which is really interesting. He had a degree in music. I've got a degree in music. And I don't even, I don't work in the music field, but I have a, I have a degree in music and he did too. But he's one of these guys that um, he got, he went into the army and took an aptitude test. And he's a clarinet player and he took an aptitude test and they say, well, I guess we'll just stick in electronics, you know, and, and Wally goes, what? And he says, well, yeah, you, I mean, you aced your electronics section of your aptitude test for the army. And he goes, I don't know. And I don't know the first thing about electronics. He goes, not according to your chess. <laughs> and he started working in, with electronics in the army, even though he had never been exposed to it before. And it uh, turns out life is a, a, is a fortuitous stumbling forward, I think, in, in a lot of ways. And Wally's fortuitous stumbling forward eventually had him invent a technology that essentially today powers every cell phone in the world. Basically, he invented some sort of technology that would change a power source the size of a warehouse to the size of a car. So he, he made a lot of money doing that, basically, because he's, he's a brilliant, brilliant man. And, and when you have so much money, you want to play with it a little bit. And Wally has been really interested in the Bigfoot thing for a long time. He was uh, the main funder of the BFRO for many, many years. He's funded a few other folks through time, including the Olympic Project, by getting them uh, various cameras and whatnot and helping obtain the property itself. And Wally is just a, a wonderful guy who ended up being a benefactor for a lot of good people in Bigfoot. But more than anything for me, he's a friend. When Wally Hersom was backing the Olympic project, the funding was used primarily for the camera trap project that the group began as. That experiment allowed the members of the group to learn from it 
and pivot into trying different and more conducive research methods. Shane and Chris's response to the question of having financial backing reflects what they have learned from that experiment, as well as what they have learned from their own self-funded research efforts. While Wally does not actively participate in Sasquatch research these days, his presence is still felt in the community, especially in the property that he purchased. So we'll be tomorrow going into this thick patch and you see the deciduous trees, the alders, and then you see the fir trees. Mm -hmm. Right as it transitions into those fir trees is where we found the trackway. And the individual from, that made the trackway was coming straight in line, perfectly north-south line, straight towards the property. So I'm setting up the therm back here just on this edge, just in case if something does come in close, because obviously it was coming in to check out what was going on here because we had a guy playing bagpipes. <laughs> so we'll set this up tonight and then, I always put an audio recorder out here anyways, you never know. Cap captured some interesting stuff sometimes. So what are you setting up right now? The thermal. Okay. That'll go 11 and a half hours. Uh, I use these a lot. It's Tascam DR05. And this is a cordless drill battery pack. And with this, basically, a USB adapter, it's like 15 bucks on Amazon. This is from my cordless drill. Fully charged, you can run one of these for four days straight. That's recording 24 seven. So I use these when we camp a lot. It is 8.05 p.m. Wednesday, September 6th, OP property. It was this report too, I had this report out here. Me, Shane, and Rebecca came up because we got a report of a trackway and it, not here, but in a different area, basically over in the National Forest. And we were just spending the night in the shop and then going out in the morning to go try to find this trackway. It was some friends of ours were camping on the property with their kids and stuff. And they were outside here goofing off. They didn't know I had the recorder in the stump. And our friend Sonny, they were, his friends were probably, oh, do a Sasquatch call. So Sonny does this goofy call. And like 10, 15 seconds after he does the call, he gets a response from back here. And uh, he comes in the shop, we we're all in the shop. And he's got this weird look on his face. And he goes, uh, Chris, uh, you don't happen to have a recorder out there, do you? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, I'm pretty sure I just got a response call. And when I reviewed it, it's funny. You hear them all laughing. He does his call and they're all like giggling and laughing. And then the response comes and everybody goes quiet. And they're like, D did you hear that? Was, was that you? What the heck? <laughs> so it was funny, but it's a good call. So. That's what's cool. You never know about this property. We come up here when we can, but it's so far away from me. It's like six hour drive for me. So eventually someday I do more of an extensive audio project here, but I've recorded horn vocals here, long howls here, weird howls and whoops and knocks on and off. We've had everybody who's been a member of the Olympic project has had at least one occasion where they've been in the shop and something's come up and slapped the side of the shop before. So, and actually when we did discovery, when you and Alex left 10 minutes after you left, something slapped the shop. So where? scared Rebecca. <laughs> I thought it was the fireplace popping, but scared Rebecca who was sleeping outside by the fireplace. And she's like, no, it was the wall. The whole wall shook. So, wow. What Chris is referring to 
is the time that I visited the Olympic Project Cabin in 2021 with the rest of the Small Town Monsters crew. Alex Petikov and I had stayed a night at the cabin before leaving early in the morning to head to the airport. Shortly after we had left, this was recorded. Rebecca Slick said she saw the wall of the cabin shake as something presumably slapped the cabin side. The sound itself is not very impressive because Chris's recorder was not near the wall that was slapped, but still, the sound was audible even at a distance. Before and after this event, Chris's recorder picked up several other anomalous sounds. Strange audio is not the only thing that has been collected at the Olympic Project Cabin. A few years ago, Cliff Berrickman actually found tracks there. I was on a multi-day expedition to the Olympic Peninsula. I like going out there. It's one of my favorite spots to just go bigfooting. If I'm not going to my regular spots, I'm going to go somewhere where I just love it, you know, and the Olympic Peninsula has, you know, I love that place. I was, uh, I think, three or four days in, and it was getting late at night. I was having a hard time finding a place to camp, and I said, well, you know, the property is just down the road like an hour. I think it was out by Forks somewhere. You know, I'll just go s sleep there, right? because you know, they're, they're all my friends and everything. As long as nobody's there, I'm sure they'd let me. So I'm driving in there and I have a hard time getting a hold of Derek. And you know, I find you know, that there's a gate there. I can't get inside the property. But it turns out gates aren't gonna stop me. I figure out a way to get inside the property is the bottom line. And I get there and I know there's cell phone reception there. Um, and if you stand just right and you hold your leg just right. So I call Derek, hey man, I'm at the property. Is that cool? And he says, yeah, yeah, no problem to stay there. And it was getting dark. I remember it was like the second half of the afternoon, probably at four or five, six at night. I think it was during the springtime. So, well, I'm gonna look around for tracks because that's what I do. And um, I started circling around and then behind one of the buildings on the property, I, I found a trackway. All right, check it out. So there's a hole, there's a hole, there's one in here, there's one there. It's a big wide spot. I'm assuming right here this this is the, uh, the butt of the palm. I don't know. I'm just here to document, man. With like something like 42, 43 inch steps, the footprints themselves were about 13 to 14 inches long. It was quite impressive, and, and at first I was like, trying to talk myself out of it, like, there's no way, no way. And, but I, the more I looked, I realized, oh, no, no, I can see toes. Yeah, these are Sasquatch footprints. It was Memorial Day weekend. Cliff had stopped by the property and found a trackway back there. It's the second one that I know of. There was one like two years ago, I believe. In the same spot? Yes. So it seems like this thing's coming out of the woods over here hiding behind the, the cabin and the shed, walking this way, and there's tracks right here, right in this area. And if you look, if you stand right here, you can see the door to the barn. Shane's truck is in the way, but normally you can see the door to the barn. And the tracks went up here and probably crossed the road. We had them flagged. But obviously the ground looks different right now. But to make an impression in this, it's got to be a heavy animal. Yeah. So a lot of times in, in that time of year, it's really cold. And people are in the barn or in their trailers. So if something was standing here watching the door, you could see every time someone comes in or out. And they say where the tracks were and I came over here to look at them. And you turn around and see, well, what was this thing doing here? Here's what it's doing. It's watching the door. And it can easily just come back here and be hidden. Especially if it was at night. But that's it. I Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Look at Chris just shut down. He was just singing Metallica and he just went. After a quick breakfast the following morning, we headed out to the trackway, where Chris was going to do the final tasks to accurately catalog the scene of the find. So, that, that week, for four days, we had a large group of people up here camping out, and uh, one individual in the, in the group had a bagpipes, and he asked if he could play the bagpipes, and we're like, yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody's ever done it up here. And Nobody's done like, it up here. Go for it, and there's a clear cut, what, about a mile, three quarters of a mile three that way. Mile. So they, a group went out to that clear cut, and he played his bagpipes and then he sporadically played them along the horse trail till he got back to the property and he had played them a little bit on the property and i want to say that was around 10 p.m or so and so it was something really unusual that's never been done and target subjects were evidently in the area and it probably inspired some intrigue and in what's going on now you know what are they doing well, the, that was the reason we kind of gave the go-ahead. First of all, we like the bagpipes. You know, I'm from Scotland. I love bagpipes, but it was something new. Maybe it'll entice something to come check this out. I was in a tree stand at the other end of the property here um, while the bagpipes were going off. I did hear a percussive. Uh, I kind of tossed it off as to being one of the one of the attendees here, one of the individuals here, possibly doing a knock, um, but apparently it wasn't. We had individuals camping on the property. Let's first said that heard stuff back in this general direction um large sticks breaking that's what they described it as mm -hmm. so you know it's where chris and i have been out this long time we're like yeah you know there's animals out here we have elk and deer and bear um, and we were just very fortunate the next following day to come back here looking for a place to put a tree stand and a couple of game cameras to st stumble on this like literally stumble on this little trackway it is august 25th 2023 uh around two o'clock this afternoon me and shane came up to put out a trail camera and we stumbled upon a trackway this was track number one it's just uh crushed ferns but what we found first nine feet this direction were these tracks toes were visible in several of them we've cast them and there's actually four tracks here because we got another crushed fern track right here where it stepped in the ferns and it's all heading towards the shop heading south due south horse trails that direction we had people on the horse trail last night speculating that it felt exposed for some reason and took off quickly causing to leave tracks slowed down in here because there's no tracks in here and as it got past this stump and the horse trails that way it decided to speed up again felt exposed or what have you it hit part of this dead log we got a slide track there track there and then another compression track into the ferns and then into the thick stuff again and we have people camped here people heard branches snapping last night so we've got eight total tracks and we will pull them tomorrow with a total of eight tracks found Chris and Shane began to walk me through the path this creature had taken in greater detail. The first track was actually right here. Yeah. And actually, no one stepped on it. The That's cool. So you can still see the heel. The, um, 
the ferns have popped up. Have this popped was up. crushed down. Oh yeah. But this is the heel, and that's where the toes were. A deer or something stepped right there. That's a deer track. Yeah. But yeah, this was the very first track. Then you had nine feet to the second track. But it well, was. Well, that was no. I mean, obviously, wasn't a nine foot. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying just, that it visibly I know left what you're saying. tracks. I'm just, I know exactly what you're saying. Just no, it does not have a nine foot step. <laughs> but this was the first noticeable damage. It was. It's 14 by 7, like the others. Second track, the cats go terrible it's nothing i mean there's actually more detail in the photograph than the actual casting well that happens a lot but, <laughs> but the ground here was way harder so it just basically all this track was was uh the the breaking of the fur needles making the outline so this is going to be labeled track number two it measures the same as the first 14 by seven and a half with the heel down here, toes this way, heading the same direction as the other tracks. On this track, if you when we look at the cast, mostly the front of the foot did damage and it was deeper down here in the toe region to the back here you could barely make out where the heel was it it was on it the front part of the foot here from part of its pad yeah which kind of i'm envisioning sneaking you know on its you got these you, you, you got not much cover here but you have a little bit of cover this would be a spot where you're you're probably i mean i'm imagining kind of looking around because you're getting into an open spot and then that's when you're gonna this is where the take off this is where the uh fourth track was and it was once again harder ground it doesn't show a lot of detail but you could visibly in the photograph and on my 3d scan you can see where the toes were and one of the i think one of the toes shows up in, yeah. the, in the actual cast yeah and it was you could actually see the you could actually see a toe at least on this particular track here which got me really excited another thing about these you know the the measurements the 14 by 7 uh if you look at the Patterson Gimlin film, Patty was a size 14. And I, I think that's also interesting. We've over the years in two different areas have cataloged and casted multiple 14 inch tracks, including the nest area, which goes along with some of my ideas and theories um, as far as a possible female Sasquatch being in the area. Okay, this is number five. It's crushed on the ferns. I honestly can't tell much because the ferns, but it's 38 inches from number four. And I never lifted this. Yeah, I did. It was the uh, only problem is we've had people up here. Yeah, and see, see that fern crush there. And it's been, what, three weeks? Yeah. But yeah, track number five is there, but this was, we had a bunch of people here. I think people walked over this one. Okay, this is track number six. We're sliding off this log. It is 27 feet from track number five. And nothing was determined between them. You have this logs running here. And once again, we have 14 sliding off the log by eight we can see where it broke off the log it hit the back in the heel hit this log and slid down i don't think anybody with wooden feet on would be trying to step on this log you can see the the abrasion on the on the root here but it pushed off the moss like you know pushed off the moss like that and skidded so when chris cast it he, he you'll see one of the cast in there's kind of got a it looks like it's got a like a, arc, a funny arch to it. It's just because it slid down this fashion, cast it this way. But it was just really interesting how it scooped that off. When you look at the 3D scan, you see how the foot's flexed in in an arch as it came down. The whole foot kind of flexed flexed up like this, and the toes hit on 
kind of on that side there i'm pretty sure the cast has some toes in it but you see move in the scan you can see the move the foot was flexing as it hit that yeah. log and skidded into the ground but for whatever reason it was moving fast where where eddie's standing around those trees there then it slowed down and it didn't create any tracks through here and then it took off right here because this one from heel to heel on this one was 46 inches, which was the longest length. So it launched right here. And then the rest of them, they're all about 30, 35 to 38 inches heel to heel. My thought is it didn't actually come through here because when I actually think it circled around yeah. this way, because there was a good smash mark here and fresh. I thought, at first I thought it was bare, you know, cause it looked like someone had been digging, but pretty sure probably for cover because as Chris right. astutely pointed out to me and I thought it was really, he was spot on and Chris, you can explain this, but Chris was looking at this area and if you, you stand here, you look where the tracks are, this is the most open area in this little location. So as Chris was thinking, you know, this would be the one spot where you need to kind of move rather briskly if you feel exposed. Um, whereas, you know, you get down here, and that's probably why there's actual impressions here. But you get on this other side, now you're back into cover. You got cover back there, you got cover here, but here you're exposed, so you're gonna move rather briskly. The trails, it's coming up here and then it loops up and around this way. So you have this open spot and you can't see the trail, but if someone's on the trail, it's only maybe 20 yards, if that, right over there. If our target subject was back here and there were people making noise on that trail, it would have felt semi-exposed right here and that's why i think it created these tracks it hurried through here because the only reason i don't i think they're in stealth mode usually and they're they're not damaging the ground but when they're in a hurry you're hurrying up you're not paying attention to how you're stepping and that's why it created the damage created the tracks it slowed down when it got to this stump which is cover and then it sped up again when it got around here for three steps and the, the distance between the heel of number six and number seven, like I said, was 46 inches, but that's the longest length between heel to heel on all these tracks. So I know when it hit that stump, it launched and was in a hurry to get into that deeper stuff. And the, the people who, there were people camped right along the edge of the property right here. And there were people that night that said, we heard branch breaks and we heard movement back here. In, in all honesty, me and Shane kind of blew it off. We're like, yeah, whatever, yeah. you know. Each footprint is unique due to the variations in the ground, especially track seven, which features a stick that was stepped on in the middle of the track. You had a limb like this where the foot had come down and the toes almost flopped down on the, so it, it almost like a hand uh, come down. Unfortunately, we stood on this one, it popped up, it kind of messed it up, but. This was really interesting, how it uh, the foot conformed over a limb, actually the same limb, just Chris cut off the other piece yeah. of it. Then we took a look at track eight, which was a track that had not yet been cast. This is track number eight. Yeah. You see where the frame was smashed. We did not cast this one, obviously. I'm gonna scan it. I'll scan it and we're gonna cast it. But yeah, that would be track number eight. beans and look I didn't get it all over say, me not too bad usually I'm wider than the tracks when I'm done doing this not too shabby 
With the track cast, Chris began his work taking measurements and notes to document the site. By measuring everything from the stride of the foot to the width of the trees and the length of logs, Chris is able to properly convey the site in a map. Since the time of filming this, Chris has completed a 70-page report, complete with photographs and diagrams that contains all the information that relates to this particular track find, including the circumstances leading up to its discovery and how they processed the scene afterwards. This report is now available on the Olympic Project website. And I have, I actually collected some of the soil from a few of the casts. Um, I have that saved just in case we want to do any, or can do any, you know, uh, eDNA on it or some sort of DNA analysis on it. Just you got to find the right lab at the right cost, the right individuals to look at it. And they're, they're out there. As we let the cast dry, we gathered our things for a quick trip up to the mountainside to look at other locations and campsites where the members of the OP have had activity before. There's my water. You're bringing your donuts? I was hey, gonna share Victor. with everybody. Victor, for dinner? What about your dinner? You don't want any donuts? When? Whenever you want them, I figured. We'll... They're for coffee in the morning. Shane looks so done. Done? You look like you're no, done. I'm just saying you're filming <laughs> donuts. <laughs> I'm not gonna donuts. use that. I was filming this sign and you guys packing up. It looked cool. And then you guys just Well, you do like one of the slow motion like I'll meet you I don't have any slow mo cameras, so I can't do it. You can edit all that later. You can slow everything down. I've done it. I'm a rookie. Really cool bench for you, just a little short long walk up there, which I'd like to, you know, it'd be really good for you to go there. Someone's been up here. Yeah, I was. You drive up there? Yeah. So we came up here, my first time up here was uh, 2017, May. And uh, we parked down below in the clear cut and we would hike everything up here. It's all uphill. So we came up here about 10.30 at night raining we came we came around this bend right here where the road turns down and as we were hiking up we got yelled at right right down over there and uh nothing really happened that night we were just here in camp and we went to bed 4 30 in the morning uh, you know we put out audio so 4 30 in the morning i got a nice clear knock right here in camp And that's really it. And there was, you know, nothing really happened while we were awake after that yell. So we just got up in the morning and left. But that's the clearest, loudest knock. Like my first good one that I had recorded here. So here we are. Well, it was up here uh, solo camping. It was May 20 something up here solo camping my kids over here around this corner it's about just a little bit after two in the morning dead quiet night like we experienced last night I hear a stick break from up in the hill so i'm laying in my tent listening and i heard some other movement you could hear like the you know stuff moving up here the salal and the, the furnace but i hear uh, just a And at first I had no idea what I was listening to. I was like, what the heck was that? You know, you got all these thoughts running your head. Do you have an elk up here? Do you have a bird flapping its wings? And then you hear something move, take off. 
and that was it that was it that night not not very exciting i mean sure you hear something like that you don't know what it is it's a little exciting but you know after reviewing the audio i started thinking to myself that sounds like a that sounds like a chest slap so i sent the audio to david ellis to really do a little more analysis on it and he comes back and he goes that's um that's that's a chest slap he visually compared it to a known gorilla chest slap visually on a on a spectrogram and it's not identical but so damn close the signature obviously the gorilla i think was in a controlled environment here we're out in the woods so it wasn't controlled but the signature visually was so similar it was crazy and he in his analysis he confirmed that there was a someone had stepped on her, a, a branch snapped it and there was some sort of movement and then that that chest slap sound so this little area this little bowl right here it's produced a lot of cool stuff and hopefully down the road here we'll get some some therm uh, some therm sin signatures out of here As strange as that audio is, it is just one piece to the larger puzzle of the Sasquatch. Taken by itself, it doesn't provide much information, but when collected together with the other experiences shared by multiple people over the years at the OP property, it becomes much more interesting. The location of this particular site is in the mountains behind the OP cabin, the direction in which the trackway had been coming from. Perhaps being here, at this campsite, is seen as an encroachment on their territory, leading to several territorial displays over the years. However, without being able to study one directly, one can only speculate on the nature of these creatures. We did not stay in the area for long, and headed back to the cabin to clean off the previous casts Chris had made. Oh yeah, gotta get it on video. Shane Corson, adventurer. Oh, I found you found that damn <laughs> This is gonna make the cut. This is the best you have. I'm sorry. That sucks. Sasquatch research at its finest, right here. After some dinner, Chris and Shane were ready to begin cleaning off the recently cast tracks. Their process involved removing the residual dirt, searching for possible hair samples. It does. There's a lot of little roots. Yeah, there's a lot of lichen too. That's the thing is, that lichen looks like hair. I'm looking for that sheen. Mm-hmm. And they're gonna be, they're not gonna be curly like a pube. No. Has the Olympic Project found hair before? So the Olympic Project has found hair um, in and outside of the nest area. I mean, as far as in the past, yes, hair has been found before the nests were discovered by the timber sparrow. When we were led down there to just, you know, uh, into the nest area, we did uh, obtain multiple hair samples. I spent countless hours scouring the material, the debris that we collected, and I found multiple samples of hair in the nest um, that uh, sent out to uh, Dr. Dr. Jeff Meldrum in his lab, but also Cindy Dosen of Hominai Enigma. And uh, her determination was from, um, she found a lot of known animals, of course, which didn't shock me, but the whatever made those nests lay, left the most amount of hair. I mean, so those nests were made by the subject matter, that might be a hair. That yeah. looks like a hair. That might be a hair. But the, the subject that made those nests left a lot of hair. And that hair lacked a medulla. You know, if you think of a pencil, it's the, the uh, lead in between the pencil. So it has no medulla. It doesn't match elk, anything out here in the Pacific Northwest. It matches primate hair. So yes, that has been verified. So yes, hair has been discovered in the nest area 
Um, I this think is track three. So. We'll bag this one. I think it might be like, and I can't really tell on it here, but it might be her. That might be her. I'm thinking root. I think I see a couple of nubs on there. That's where I just caught a glint of the nubs. It's black, black though. Yeah. Well, this was bag and tag. Yeah. It's not off yet. There it is. Yeah. So have you gotten those hairs DNA tested? No, so the funny thing about hair, or the unfunny thing about hair, even within, you know, if you look at client crime labs, hair deteriorates really quickly. And really what you want to look at is the follicles on the hair. So you want that little, uh, you know, someone wants to pluck a hair and they have a little follicle at the end of it. That's where the DNA really is going to be tested. Most of the hair we, we have found over the years is older. You can look at it visually, but there's nothing to take away from that. But honestly, with the hair that we're looking at now, it's older, uh, it's more of a visual scientific look at rather than an eDNA or DNA study on that. If we had follicles on it, sure, there's a, a chance. So what we're trying to do right now, these tracks, these impressions are fresh. We're looking for a hair. To find a follicle would be amazing on a hair. Most likely what we're gonna find is a lot of rodent hair, um, elk hair, deer hair. By chance, we may come across a hair that fell off of this individual that left these tracks. And uh, we'll be able to collect that and look at that visually. You know, send it to a lab, they can look at it visually. But it's, it's so difficult to test this stuff DNA-wise. The last detailed hair analysis was conducted by Cindy Dosen in 2017. Her analysis concluded that the hair samples she had received from the Olympic project were uncut hair, lacking a medulla, and from an unknown animal. However, as Shane stated, with no follicle and no medulla, there is no DNA data to be collected from the hair samples. We have something running around here that lacks medulla in their hair. And under a microscope too, which is really fascinating, is a lot of these hairs have red pigmentation in the hair, you know? So you look at it visually, it looks dark or black, but underneath a microscope, some of these hairs have a red pigmentation or granules in there. And if you look at a lot of the Sasquatch sightings, especially here on the West Coast in British Columbia, people talk about a cinnamon colored Sasquatch or a reddish colored Sasquatch. That fascinates me because a lot of reports talk about, oh, it's black or it's brown. But most of those encounters happen at nighttime. But are you actually looking at something that's more cinnamon or reddish in color, which would match the fauna out here perfectly? Although these tracks are not the picture-perfect tracks many Sasquatch enthusiasts would like, the detail captured throughout the several tracks paint a picture of a foot, while superficially looking like ours, actually bends and moves in different ways. It is difficult to fully capture on camera, but each track displays something unique about the foot that made it. Some demonstrate toes in a much more prominent light, while others show a curving foot wrapping around debris on the ground, as seen in track seven. What's really cool about this in particular print or impression was that it stepped over a uh, limb on the ground, like a large limb on the ground, and the toes um, wrapped around. So it's almost like a hand, which I would expect to find. It's almost like a hand. So if you imagine, here's the heel back here. You have this large limb. It didn't just, it's not cookie cutter. It just didn't go flat. The toes kind of wrapped around this end right here and flexed. So it was uh, just like a hand on the ground almost, which I expect from a, a uh, primate. In the weeks following, Chris finished cleaning the tracks in his home and then traveled to the North American Bigfoot Center where Cliff Berrickman took a look at them. Olympic Peninsula, I take it? Yeah, the OP headquarters. Of I'm dialed in with the people at the Olympic Project. I mean, they're all pretty much my friends, you know? So when they get footprints, or let alone a trackway, I hear about it pretty soon. And I heard that they had cast a trackway actually at the Olympic Project headquarters, right? The, the cabin that they have in the woods, which is phenomenal because number one, the Olympic Project are excellent researchers. They are gonna do their best to document the site and cast everything that is even has a chance of showing detail. So I was thrilled to hear that they had discovered that.
that. So that is now, to my knowledge, at least the second time that footprints had been found and cast at the site, which I love because at my two main study areas down in Oregon, I am finding the same individual's footprints in almost exactly the same places months and months apart. They're going to the same areas again and again and again. And the fact that we have now two, maybe even three, track finds at the headquarters itself, that implies that they're coming back. We are gonna find more at the headquarters. Three of them pretty clearly here, that these two are kind of lost, but, and then there's a, a slight indication of a mid-tarsal right there. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I mean, this isn't, I mean, you, you show it to 100 people, they're gonna say, oh, but did you, you know. That's cool, I'm glad you're, you're seeing that, because I can see it when I, when I put everything together, when I look at my photographs, and then look at the scan, and then look at the charts, I'm seeing stuff. Yeah. If I was to just look at that by myself, I'm like, I don't see as much. You gotta look at a lot of casts, man. I know you yeah. have, that's <laughs> yeah. why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> There's one. Uh, almost all the tracks that we cast and that I scanned show that there was more weight put on the front of the foot than the back of the foot in most cases. I think that's I think that's the way they roll. Yeah. And not only because that's where they push off from, but I think that's the way I don't I don't think the heels I think they come down flat footed mm -hmm. more often than not and then push off. Right. This is a nice one. This is like nice heel shape and whatnot. And actually it kind of looks like and it does this. Yeah. Like the, that's where the turn happens, which of course is at the metal tarsals. If people, I mean, the big footers understand that like if they move like that, what they don't understand is that they move like that, mm -hmm. like, you know, like like that. Right. And also like this. Okay. Yeah, the flexibility that is, makes sense. is off the chart. It's not just like this. That makes total sense. But people think because they see it in books, they think two dimension, but it's not. It's that and that and that. You can, yeah, you can, you'll see it in track three. It's, it's, I almost know heel shows up in track three, but the front of the foot's moving weird like. Mm -hmm. You'll see mm -hmm. it. You can see one, two, three, four, and then the big toe's just missing. And that was the left foot, and it was right by the tree, right after the second one. And like, we looked on that tree for hair, didn't find anything, but I told, mm -hmm. like I told Chance, that it touched this tree, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can see, I can totally see the shape. Yeah, the big toe is like up at this time. Dor uh, uh, dorsiflexed. Is dorsiflexed. Yeah. Like dorsal fin on the back of a okay. shark or a dolphin. Dorsiflex means flex upwards. So that that's what was going on here. And then these just impress more deeply. Yeah, so I'd say those are toes. I think all four of those are toes. And the that's what I thought. Cool. Over here somehow, just a dorsiflexed out of the way. Yeah, that's a cool one. That's a really cool one. And it's not, it's a cast only a mother can love, as I say, but, um, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't even think to bring my clippers. This will be a fun one to clean. I didn't even know that stick was there. This one right here. Mm hmm. Doubt this is going to show much, but at least we did it. There might be something in here. It'll be like the others where the scans and the the scans actually show more detail than the tra the cast anymore. That's why I like doing the scans because a lot of tracks it's hard to get. I mean, because of this this fur duff stuff, it doesn't hold a lot of detail, and the scan will actually show the impression better once than the pour, as you've seen with the other tracks down there. There she be. As our time at the cabin drew to a close, I was reminded once again of the important work being done by the Olympic Project, and by Chris Spencer in particular. Hardly any track find gets the level of documentation Chris has provided for this trackway. Few people meticulously clean tracks in search of hair, and even fewer get their tracks vetted by an external source. 
this level of effort might be the only way one could hope that the subject of Sasquatch research is taken seriously. The Olympic Project Cabin is full of stories, but at the end of the day, it is not the stories that will prove the existence of Sasquatch, but rather well-documented facts and evidence collected. And this trackway is just another step along the road to discovery.